Hello. In this problem, we are given some experimental testing data about a solid object. And we want to compare it to our properties, our material properties for these metallic uh, materials. So we're looking at some aluminum alloys. I've got some cast iron alloys, copper alloys, and magnesium alloy, three steel alloys, and titanium alloy. This table is taken from the reference book for the Fundamentals of Engineering exam. And um, this table does continue to also show some non-metallic materials. Um, but in this problem, we just need the metallic section of the table. So I just pasted in the top half. All right, let's read this problem. So we find a random cylinder on campus. We know it's some sort of metallic alloy, but we're just not sure which one. Curious, we head to a material testing machine and load it in tension. All right, could draw this in. Um, 3D if I wanted to, but I think I'm just going to draw it in 2D. So let's see, we've got a length of 12 inches, so drawing kind of a 2D free body diagram here, 12 inches. And our cross-sectional area of the cylinder is 2 inches squared. So I'll just draw a circle to represent the cross section. And instead of giving a radius or a diameter, the area is just kind of given. So I'll just say area is equal to two inches squared. And that cross sectional area is this one, right? So I'm just taking, this is just a side view of the cylinder in 2D, cut that plane, rotate 90 degrees in your head and draw that cross section. All right, we're going to load it in tension. So tension means arrows pointing away from the member. And during the test, the material does yield. All right, yielding commences at a tensile force of 100 kips. So I'll go ahead and add that to my free body diagram. And the deformation is 40 E3 inches. So that's going to be my deformation. So lowercase delta is the right symbol for that idea. 40 E minus 3 inches. OK, and we want to identify what material this is. All right, how are we going to approach this? Well, basically, things that we know about materials so far is we know that we can calculate a stress by dividing force over area. We know that we can calculate a strain by looking at the ratio from of deformation to length. And we know a little bit about material properties. So if we plot stress versus strain, we know that ductile metals or metals in general here, metallic alloys, kind of the information that's given or assumed, they're going to have this linear portion of the stress strain curve. And after that, you know, it's kind of material specific as to what exactly happens next in that stress strain curve. So I'll just put kind of a question mark there to show that we don't really know. We don't need to know that to solve this problem, but we're going to start with this linear, linearly elastic range. Okay, during the test, the material yields. And so we're thinking in terms of what is this yield stress right there? And what is this yield strain right there? Okay. Let's go ahead and, um, and again, we're going to calculate kind of actual stresses from our experiment here on the right. And then in the table, we see some stuff that's tabulated. I think let's run through that before we start doing additional calcs. So the specific weight pounds per inches cubed, you know, we don't, we could do this, right? We could take our sample and weigh it and then compare that to the table, but that information isn't given. So we're not going to be able to use this column at all. Modulus of elasticity, that's the ratio of stress to strain in the linearly elastic range of the material. So let's definitely hang on to that. That's going to be good. And in fact, I will write that equation as well. 
So the slope of that line is the modulus of elasticity. It is the ratio of stress to strain in the linearly elastic range. All right, so we're going to hang on to that in our table. The modulus of rigidity, we haven't covered this yet. We're going to get into shear next, and you'll figure out what that's all about soon enough. But we don't need that for this. We're just loading in tension so the modulus of rigidity doesn't come into play. And as you can see at the end of the chart, we have several things tabulated. We have yield and ultimate strength values. And we have that for tension, compression, and shear. As mentioned, we're in this problem, we are loading in tension. So in other words, we do not need any of these compressive strength values. And we do not need these shear values. So just to kind of keep us focused on the problem, we'll cross some of this stuff out. All right. Let's go ahead and run through some of these equations. I'm going to slide this over here temporarily. Let's plug into this first equation and see what the stress in the cylinder is. And our normal force we get from the free body, that's 100 kips of tension. Our cross sectional area, that's the area of the circular cross section, that is 2 inches squared. That divides out to 50 ksi. The material says that that is when yielding occurs. So in other words, we have just determined that the yield stress of this particular material is 50 ksi experimentally. Now, if you've spent any time in a laboratory of any sort, you'll know that the values you get from the experiments don't always match what you expect 100%. There's always some error. Um, there's always some scatter due to um, various things, various things. And here, what I want to do is compare that 50 ksi to these um, values here in the table. So if I'm looking at these yield stresses, you know, 60 seems high, 37 seems high, 11.4 is so far off that I'd probably eliminate that right off the bat. Um, I see 50, which is exactly what I calculated. So I'm going to hang on to that one. Um, you know, 22 is pretty low. So I'm kind of ruling out magnesium at this point. You know, some of these lower grades of steel and this really high strength steel, I'm going to eliminate all of that. Um, and titanium, of course, is a very, very strong material. So we can eliminate that one as well. All right. What else can we check from this table? Do we have any information given that would allow us to check the ultimate strength? And the answer is no. So we were not given any more information in this problem that would allow us to construct this curve, whatever happens when the material goes into inelastic behavior. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of mark or kind of um, block out that part of the table because we are not going to need that to solve the problem either. All right, so we've got a couple good um, candidates here, uh, but like any good engineer, let's let's take another data point. And what I want to do is figure out the modulus of elasticity from this experiment, and that's going to help me get a little more data um, to determine what material this is. Okay. All right, so let's plug into this equation. I need to know what the strain is. And I'll just kind of keep this in its full form. So I've got my stress divided by plug in that ratio of deformation to length and plug everything in using uh, the information that's given. So our yield stress, we computed that as 50 ksi up above. That goes in the numerator. The length of the member undeformed, that has a length of 12 inches. In the denominator, we need our deformation. And that is right here. That's how much elongation was measured in the test. I'll put that down here in the denominator. All 
as always, kind of spot check your units at this point. And I've got inches and inches there. That leaves KSI. And those are good units for the modulus, modulus of elasticity. In fact, you can see here in the table, they are shown in terms of 10 to the 3 KSI. We can go ahead and multiply or you know perform this operation in our calculator. And we will get 15 E3 KSI. And sometimes I get a question here. We use these um, metric prefix uh, metric prefixes when we're in SI units, international system of units. This problem is in US customary units. It is very rare. It is, I mean, sometimes I've seen this, sometimes I've seen this, but it is very rare to combine these and call that like a mega pound per square inch, okay? Sometimes you see it, so it'd be like an MSI, but it is exceedingly rare. I think most people would prefer just to be left in KSI. And as you can see, that's what our table does. So 10.3 KSI is in the legend. And so all we need to do is figure out what materials have a stiffness, a modulus of elasticity of 15 E3. And again, these are pretty low. So at this point, I'm ruling out the aluminums. Um, this one's a little bit high. I'm going to cross that one out. This one's certainly close. This one's spot on. That one's too low. This one's, you know, basically doubled. So kind of ruling out a lot of material here. We don't have steel. We don't have magnesium. We already know we don't have titanium just because of the, um, the yield stress. And yeah, so we're starting to really zoom in on an answer. We were able to eliminate red brass as a copper alloy, we eliminated that just looking at the yield stress. So even that modulus of elasticity is close enough for experimental error. It's close enough to that 15 that I would take it seriously, except that it yields um, down at 11.4 KSI. My specimen yielded all the way up at 50 KSI. So I can eliminate that one as well. And process of elimination is that the material we must have has got to be bronze. Um, when I first assigned this problem, I intentionally made these numbers, the 50 and the 15, not match the table precisely because I wanted students to do a little bit of reasoning to come up with an answer. And I think they were students were so confused that their numbers didn't match the table precisely that I've changed the problem and made it precisely. At some point, I think I might make it more ambiguous again now that I have the ability to post these tutorials to kind of encourage a little bit of deeper thinking about the reliability of experimental data. All right, cool. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching.